Well, type 1 diabetes is considered an autoimmune condition, and type 2 is the one that the vast majority of Americans have, and that's due to lifestyle changes. So the if you have one autoimmune condition, you are three times more likely to get another. Mm -hmm. And there is an association between Hashimoto's and type 1 diabetes, mm -hmm. vice versa, right? I mean, typically, um, classically, type 1 was con called juvenile diabetes because, in general, that is something that came out much earlier in life. I mean, you and I discussed at one point your diagnosis of having uh, diabetes yeah. and then later realizing that you had this tumor in your pancreas. And I was saying to you, I bet that tumor was there all the way back when you got diagnosed because it is very unusual for someone to be in their 30s or 40s and get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Now I will also make, not after COVID shots though. Well, that, and I was going to make that I was going to make the caveat that um, COVID, COVID uh, vaccinations, both of them, and just the world that we live in today, we are seeing people who don't have genes for certain autoimmune conditions getting them. We're seeing a rise in autoimmune conditions. We're seeing a rise in cancers. So I mean, almost like all bats are off in a sense that. Right? You know, cancer is coming day. at a much younger rate. Autoimmunity is exploding. And so I think the landscape has completely changed. But generally speaking, you know, to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in your 30s or 40s is highly unusual. And it's typically in childhood. So that was when you were telling me your story that it really, um, you know, has spiked my spidey sense of saying, wait, something else was going on mm -hmm. here. And my guess is that you probably were already, you know, developing the tumor on your pancreas at that point. And that is actually, I don't know, I mean, have you been diagnosed with um, is islet cell antibodies? Hello, hello, Heal Squad. Welcome back. Excited for today's episode. We're going to start with our quote of the day. It comes from our guest, actually. When it comes to the treatment of autoimmune conditions, conventional medicine has failed miserably. Guess you're going to want to listen to this, guys. Dr. Amy Myers is in studio today. She's a medical doctor, two-time New York Times bestselling author, internationally acclaimed functional medicine physician. She specializes in empowering those with autoimmune thyroid uh, SIBO, candida, and gut issues to reverse their conditions and reclaim their health. After finding uh, or founding her own clinic, Dr. Myers launched the e-commerce wellness brand, Dr. Amy Myers, or Amy Myers MD is what it's called, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, reaching millions worldwide with her 75 plus personally formulated products and programs. She is the author of The Autoimmune Solution, The Thyroid Connection, and The Autoimmune Solution Cookbook. In 2024, Dr. Myers launched the Take Back Your Health podcast to empower people seeking optimal health and the latest breakthroughs in functional medicine. Really excited to have you back here today, Dr. Amy, alongside husband Kevin and Natasha, who are also in studio today. Um, so you, last time we had you on the show, we talked a lot of autoimmune. Yes. Funny enough, I woke up just, was it yesterday? And I had done some bioresonance and thyroid popped up and he's like, yeah, you're, you're dealing with some thyroid stuff. I was like, oh, okay. But I've like always dealt with thyroid stuff. So I kind of take it for granted. And then I was like, oh, things are fitting a little tight. <laughs> Mm. Oh, I gained 10 pounds and didn't even realize it. Really love it on the face, by the way, but, um, and I'm not fine with it everywhere else, but I, I was like, okay, that's why I'm so tired. And then I realized, oh, maybe the bloat isn't bloat. Maybe it's connected to this. And then I read something about thyroid belly. Is that a real thing? Well, yes. I mean, when you have low thyroid, everything slows down and you can, of course, gain weight. You feel tired. Your hair can fall out. Um, you can feel cold. But also there's an association between small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and Hashimoto's thyroiditis as well. Oh, so, that's what I have. Yeah. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is where you have um, an overgrowth of your good bacteria. And that's where maybe your stomach is flat in the morning and then you eat some food, particularly carbs, and then maybe you look three to six months pregnant. Totally. So. But I feel like I look three to six months pregnant like round the clock now. It's going to really suck when I go to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you look great. Thank but, you. you know. 
Yeah, but that's that's an issue. But then mm-hmm. does that also cause constipation? I bet. So SIBO classically can cause diarrhea, but it can cause constipation in certain people. For me, I've had SIBO a number of times in my life, and for me, it always does cause constipation. But classically, if you look in the medical literature, it's likely more diarrhea for people. Okay. But, but Hashimoto's or low thyroid itself can cause constipation. Everything is slowing down. Isn't it so wild? that in the regular world now, we have all these symptoms and I'm just so grateful that I've learned so much and I'm so aware and that I start doing the investigating and putting things together because I put it all together this morning. I'm like, oh, it's it's all coming from there because I, but normally what somebody would do is they'd go to CVS and they'd go get something for constipation over the counter and then they'd deal with that laxative and then they'd, take some more coffee and be like, okay, I'm sluggish and tired. I'm gonna have more coffee. But, and by the way, I did at one point, I was having two coffees. I was like, okay, I'm not making it through the day. I have a baby. And then I just sat down. I was like, okay, we need to take inventory here of what's happening. And, and then I also started to realize that I had more energy yesterday when I didn't red light. And I'm thinking the red light must be doing so much detoxing and things Uh, that it's making it even more sluggish. Well, it could be. The other thing is, you know, luckily you have this uh, wealth of knowledge around you. And so you are able to identify these things because worse yet, you're a new mom. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's a year, but it's still a new mom, right? And so you go to the doctor and it's like, you're a new mom. Mm -hmm. You're a woman, you're a new mom, so you're tired, you're not getting sleep. I mean, I know you didn't deliver yourself, but you know, if someone, if you had, oh, of course, that's why you've gained weight, you just had a baby, right? I mean, they just gaslight us women Mm -hmm. and just dismiss us as new moms or perimenopause or menopause instead of actually saying maybe you do have a problem. I mean, that is also classic after delivering a baby or going into perimenopause or menopause that you might get an autoimmune condition, that you might get a thyroid condition. And so these are times that we shouldn't be gaslit, that we shouldn't be dismissed, and that things really should be checked out for us. Wait, I didn't know perimenopause could instigate this. Yes, it's our, it, we believe one of the main causes for more autoimmunity in women than men is due to our hormones and the fluctuation in our hormones, particularly estrogen. So after delivering a baby, you have these high estrogens during uh, pregnancy and then crash right after delivery, unless you're doing something like placental encapsulation and taking back your hormones. Perimenopause, you have these high fluctuations in your in your hormones day daily, weekly, and then of course menopause, you have a big shift and crash in your in your hormones. And it is during these fluctuations or during these periods that um, women are at more risk of having autoimmune conditions. Wow. I also learned this morning with my quick research um, that autoimmunity, so thyroid issues, um, tend to lead in some cases in small amounts, like 15 to 20%, of people, that's what leads to type one diabetes too. Well, type one diabetes is considered an autoimmune condition and type two is the one that the vast majority of Americans have and that's due to lifestyle changes. So the if you have one autoimmune condition, you are three times more likely to get another. Mm-hmm. And there is an association between Hashimoto's and type one diabetes, mm-hmm. vice versa, right? I mean, typically, Um, Classically, type 1 was called juvenile diabetes because, in general, that is something that came out much earlier in life. I mean, you and I discussed at one point your diagnosis of having uh, diabetes and then later realizing that you had this tumor in your pancreas. And I was saying to you, I bet that tumor was there all the way back when you got diagnosed because it is very unusual for someone to be in their 30s or 40s and get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Now I will also make, not after COVID shots though. Well, that, and I was going to make that. I was going to make the caveat that um, COVID, COVID uh, vaccinations, both of them, and just the world that we live in today, we are seeing people who don't have genes for certain autoimmune conditions getting them. We're seeing a rise in autoimmune conditions. We're seeing a rise in cancers. So, I mean, almost like all bets are off in a sense that. Right? You know, cancer is coming at a much younger rate, autoimmunity is exploding. And so I think the landscape has completely changed. But generally speaking, you know, to be diagnosed with 
type 1 diabetes in your 30s or 40s is highly unusual and it's typically in childhood. So that was when you were telling me your story that it really, um, you know, has spiked my spidey sense of saying, wait, something else was going mm -hmm. on here. And my guess is that you probably were already, you know, developing the tumor on your pancreas at that point. And that is actually, I don't know, I mean, have you been diagnosed with um, islet cell antibodies? Um, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they did all the tests and every which way, they're like, you're type one. I'm like, no, I'm not. I know I'm not. Yeah. And that's the battle where I'm always now trying to figure out like what came first. Right. Did the tumor activate an insulin issue because it was in there hurting everything? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I get, I'll never really know. Um, yeah, but we, we always never know. It's, I've been actively yeah. trying to heal because I know that if that wasn't the original issue, if I do everything right, I perhaps could heal from this. But it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster. And then with the thyroid issues, my blood sugars are becoming really erratic. Like I'm riding a roller coaster every day, and it's so unfair because I eat so well and so clean that I'm like ping ponging nonstop. Mm -hmm. And so I have to get the thyroid under control. But it was just interesting that all of this was just happening. And I never think the timing is coincidental. It's just so funny that you're here today. And this is what you do. And so I was just like, Oh, wow, I, I would have never known all of these things were dovetailing and creating each other. Mm -hmm. But it's so important now. And you know, thank you for having this show. Because we have to be advocates for ourselves nowadays. I mean, I, I really, I keep my medical license even though I no longer have a clinic, I've retired clinically, really for myself and my family, you know? I mean, it's to go into a doctor just blindly and say, I have these symptoms and to not be educated in any kind of way, it's, um, I mean, it's kind of a travesty to be honest with you. Yeah, it becomes an invitation for the gaslighting, I think, because mm -hmm. if you don't know, they don't have time to know. They yeah. don't have time to know. No, they don't. So they're just going to be like, oh, it's probably just this. And then they're rushing off to their next thing. Or they'll put you on medication you didn't even need. The other thing I'm starting to watch, because I'm I'm involved in so many people's health care behind the scenes all the time, because everyone comes to me. I'm seeing so many people being over-prescribed and over-diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So there's there are people, they're, they're prescribing preventative chemo and preventative re radiation, and I'm like, wait, it was a benign tumor. They got the entire thing out. Why do they want to do this? It's a trillion dollar industry. It's a trillion dollar industry. But people don't want to believe that. And I don't want to believe it, but I know it's well, true. Well, you're afraid for your life. Well, I mean. So, I mean, like, you know what I mean? When it's put in front of you like that, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it, you're so scared. You go, okay, okay, I'll, <clears throat> you know, because I, I know if, if, yeah, if there were a chance that it could still be there. I mean, I, I, I don't no, know. No, but imagine. Just Let's just talk about this for a second. Yeah. A girl told me she had a benign tumor in her nasal passage. They removed the entire thing, they said. And they told her she had to do MRIs every three months, which is horrifying mm -hmm. to me. Okay. Particularly if there's gadolinium dye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, the and fact by, that by they me. make, hold on, the fact that they make all of these tests seem nebulous, like it's nothing, and yet they ha they come with such serious complications and risks and and the accumulation of them is really bad but can she speak to the well, yeah well yeah. Let, let, let's the, well let's the, the yeah let's be clear dye. i mean an mri an mri in and of itself is a large magnet and anything in medicine i like to look at as risk benefit so you i i don't know you did pronova that's how yours was that's found right, how right? They i've done pronova right so they offered me a free exam i would do something like pronova you know depending on your budget and your risk factors once a year once every couple of years there is that we know of no downside to a regular mri it's a magnet versus a cat scan that has radiation associated with it or a um you know, a mammogram or a chest x-ray, those all have radiation associated with it. Now the gadolinium <clears throat> dye is a uh, heavy metal. And when I was in practice, I often checked people for their heavy metal burden in their body. And I saw high, high levels of gad gadolinium in a lot of people. And they would say, oh, I had that, you know, I had that MRI um, 20 years ago. 
And there are studies now showing that the gadolinium crosses the blood-brain barrier and that it can accumulate in the brain. So now, again, you have to go risk-benefit. I have a half-sister right now. She was 30 when she was diagnosed triple negative breast cancer. She's now, she was stage three, now she's stage four after chemo radiation and, or chemo and a mastectomy. And the, I got a text, we're not close, um, but I got a text to say, here's what you should do for prevention. And this is what her mother and her sister are doing, which is, um, which is a mammogram every six months and an MRI with gadolinium every six months. <clears throat> and it's like, well, if you don't have cancer now, you know, gonna, after yeah. all of this, you're gonna have it. I mean, I didn't. So what does somebody do? That's my thing. Okay, so I personally just had a breast cancer scare. And so I've gotten very interested in this. And so something like 30 to 50% of women, myself included, and my sister have very dense breast tissue, yes, fibrocystic too. breast. And so the, the, um, the mammogram is not good for that. It is good for a solid tumor, but it is not good for us. There are so many false negatives that then lead to a biopsy that then <clears throat> That's lead- That's unnecessary. Yes, I've had, I had one of those 10 years ago. Then they put in a titanium clip. I was thankful. I was able as a physician to convince my doctor to not do that to me. And, um, and then, you know, you get a mammogram every year, which I have dutifully done and will not do again. Me too. But so you can get an ultrasound or there's something now called a QT scan. Right now there are only four locations in the country, but I flew to Scottsdale and got one done, which is a very high powered uh, ultrasound that can look at things almost on a cellular level. It's painless, your, your breast is in warm water and then an ultrasound goes around it and, and images the breast. So hopefully um, this is something that will roll out, but you could request ultrasound. You could do that thermography. That was the other one um, I was looking into. So yes, yeah, so I have typically, I've missed a couple of years, but done thermography and I did a mammo. Um, I in my clinic saw many people that picked something up on thermography, didn't see it on mammo and vice versa. So I do think that thermography can be really good at you know subtle changes, but it may be important to get some additional imaging such as ultrasound. In all of this, I went back and looked at all of my, you know, the reports of all my mammos from the last 10 years and only, you know, they all said fibrocystic breast, repeat MRI. Mm -hmm. Only one said fibrocystic breast, get an ultrasound. So I should have been put into the ultrasound yes. group early on 10 years ago, and I should have been getting ultrasounds every yeah. year instead of a instead of a mammo which now that i've researched this gives radiation equivalent to a hundred chest x-rays yes i saw that and, yeah. and do, they recommend the mammo for safety or because of it's just more money or just their... it's tradition yeah i mean there's a lot of um there's a lot of research <clears> in places <throat> that are not recommending mammography because of the radiation and and then they'll tell you oh well it's no different than flying across the country on a plane but that's scattered radiation this is smushing your breast which some will also say if you do have any type of cancer could disruption. lead to yes yeah. disruption and then it's very pointed radiation so, uh -huh. and then there are all kinds of tests that I've realized, because then of course they said, you need to go get another biopsy or an MRI. And I again declined those. And there are now blood tests that will pick up if you have circulating tumor cells and even identify them. Which blood tests? Oh, uh, well, there's several. The one that I did is called RGCC. Um, there are several other companies that I can, I don't, I haven't done them myself, so I don't want to yeah. speak to them. And then what they'll do, the report will say, you know, these are your circulating tumor cells. This is the level. And then if you want to do traditional chemotherapy, here are the agents that it's sensitive to. And here are all the natural treatments that it's sensitive to, curcumin, um, you know, mushrooms, all this various stuff. So you have an Options. option or maybe you want to do something because I mean, I literally went to the point of investigating where would I go if this was real yeah. of places that are doing integrative where they actually do use chemotherapy, but they do it at a very low dose. They get you on a ketogenic diet. They give you a dose of insulin right before your chemo. So, mm. so, you know, your cells go quiescent and then, and then the cancer cells are ready to take up the chemo and then they can give you much lower levels. Wow. And then they have a test that says, these are the therapeutic agents 
that are actually work against your particular cancer. Yeah. And then they add in things like ozone, hyperbarics, maybe infrared sauna, high dose vitamin C. I mean, it's it's a full, you know, there's nothing to say that chemo, well, chemo is bad, but you know, you want to be making sure you're if you're using chemo, it's of course at the lowest dose and it's the one that's going to work for you. And then yeah. what other things can you do to support your whole body so that it can actually work and not kill just the cancer cells, but maybe kill you too. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I always say, like with my mom, I was like, okay, we're going to do the chemo and radiation because we, we didn't have a lot of options with a brain tumor, but we're going to support her body and her immune system so it can handle the barrage of treatments. So we were doing the high dose vitamin C and the, the, um, not colon cleanses, the, um, coffee enemas, coffee enemas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And all of that to help her. And that's why we were so successful, I think. But were you about to ask something? No, I was going to say we should probably take a break, Maria, and okay. continue this. Okay, let's take a break because I have so many questions. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. I have so many questions, and I'm so excited that this conversation just went here. So I, when they found the pancreas tumor, they also found... Um, a lesion in my lung and they found a lump in my breast and I was like you gotta be shitting me so I was like okay the breast I was waiting for a mammogram even though I did not know until right now that the mammogram wasn't effective in that way me I thought either. and here I'm at you're an educated person yeah. interviewing all of these people I'm a functional medicine physician. <laughs> I did not either until yeah. I was really faced with, you know, is this happening to me? And then how did I get here? And what do I do to not be here? Yeah, I thought that that covered certain things. And then the ultrasound, Dr. Funk would have me do an ultrasound every year and the manual, t um, you know, yeah, exam. feeling exam. But, um, but my naturopath was like, she was done with mammos from what I remember and was suggesting thermography. And so after pancreas surgery, I was like just days out of the hospital. They were like, we have an availability. So I like hobbled in with Kevin and they checked my breast and they said that they thought it was fine. And I was like, okay, well, last time you thought I was fine. So I'm not going to trust you, but I don't have time to deal with this now. I got to deal with this recovery of baby coming. When I went back in November, I got the clear, all clear sign that it had shrunk. So... Long story short, I also went to the Dominican Republic earlier this year, and mm -hmm. I haven't shared this because I didn't know how to share it safely um, because I don't want to scare people from getting necessary MRIs and necessary scans. Of course. This is part of the education, I think, Heal Squad, is we have to learn what is, and then we start navigating more carefully. So now that you know that these scans and tests come with, you know, real dangerous effects. Um, in fact, can you explain to people when you say it crosses the MRI gadolinium, crosses the blood brain barrier, will you explain what that does? Sure, I mean, I we have barriers. You often, people who know me, hear me talking about the gut barrier and having a leaky gut can lead to inflammation. It can lead to food sensitivities. It leads to um, lots of larger molecules that are not meant to get into our bloodstream. They're allowed to get in when you have a leaky gut. They have now discovered that there is a blood brain barrier and the same type of thing can happen. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this area, so the mechanism, but I imagine it's somewhat similar to the gut. Although the gut we know is already semi-permeable because it's how we digest and absorb our food. The brain, on the other hand, this is a heavy metal. So of course, if you have a leaky gut or whatever, I mean, it's it's disseminating throughout your body. But I think the thought when giving this is that people would excrete this and that it would eventually just get out of your system. But instead, it can cross into your brain and it can accumulate there. Now, what the long-term effects are, you know, I'm sure there's some studies, you know, showing, I don't know, whether it's brain tumors mm -hmm. to dementia to, you know, and if you've had one MRI, um, you know, like, let's not freak out, right? This yeah. We're talking about the people who now, look, my Like sis, me, I have to get them all the time. Right, or my, you know, sister has, should she survive this if she needs to monitor her breast cancer, <clears throat> you know, triple negative? That seems like 
risk benefit, right? Like you have this really devastating type of cancer and you need to monitor it. But for someone who doesn't have this and then the doctor is saying, this is your prevention, that's where I might say, well, the risk of this with gadolinium dye is much greater than not. I mean, 10 yeah. years ago when I had a biopsy, they said, now you need to go do an MRI. And I said, well, no, thank you. Is it going to have gadolinium dye? And as a physician, I know that if you don't have the dye, the reason the dye is there is to pick up very small tumors or to pick up small things. And so I knew doing the MRI without the gadolinium dye wasn't probably going to pick up you know, what they thought, so I opted to not do it. They also told me to go on tamoxifen, and I asked my oncologist, and she said, well, I wouldn't do it. I'm like, okay. I knew I didn't want to do it, but when I asked the oncologist, and she says, I wouldn't deal with tamoxifen for 10 years, I said, okay. I just took my product, EstroProtect, I take it every day. Um, so, I mean, that's where you really have to look at the risk benefit of something. If you are a cancer survivor, and this is the only way that they can determine, then maybe you, that, is the you know the benefit that you need to go with and the risk is diminished versus someone who's proactively has nothing but has a family history is this something you want to be doing every year yeah. you know or are there other things like these blood tests that or are Pernuvo now coming around or... right or Pronovo Pronovo though is gonna that's equivalent to doing the MRI without the gadolinium dye and so the tumor has to be of a certain size which is a great way to just go, you know, get a full body scan because you can't really do that through your regular doctor. That would cost you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So Pronovo definitely is a great resource. But when you're getting the gadolinium dye in a, in a MRI, you're able to pick up something even smaller. Yeah. But I would back up and just say like, as these tests, now none of them are perfect that I understand. They're 85, 90% specific and sensitive which is not 100%. So you're gonna have some false positives, you're gonna have some false negatives, but you know some of these tests are covered by insurance uh, that will detect you know, what type of cancer cells you have and they're beginning to use mm -hmm. them more widely for monitoring for yeah. certain types of cancer. So as these become more widely available, that's what you know, I would recommend versus doing any type of imaging because it's a blood draw. Yeah, there's also, I know, I know. The, there's also one other thing to that that's really sad is imagine you go and you do all these MRIs or gadolinium and they still miss it. They, oh, it's yeah. there and they miss it. So now you've risked your life to take more of that stuff. I'm going to take a quick break. But before I do, I want to just share with everybody. Um, I don't know if you shop at Macy's ever, but Macy's is a huge sponsor and supporter of our show. It was one of my first jobs. So it's very nice that we've come awesome. full circle here. Um, and I want to make sure I mention them because we are nearing the end of summer, of course, friends, heading into back to school. I don't think it's too early, say, heading into the holiday season because I saw some Halloween stuff out there. I did too. It's crazy. And it's crazy, but it's here, guys. <laughs> so um, Macy's has you covered for whatever season it is, whether you're still enjoying some fun summer plans or you're getting your back to school wardrobe. Um, I don't know if you know this as well, but they have free personal styling services, which I am a big fan of. Actually trying to put an event together so I can help style some people whoever wants to come to our event. Um, we're in the middle of trying to put that together because I love styling people. So Macy's has a free stylist program. I highly recommend you guys use it, especially if you're going back to work and you want a new look or you want somebody to help you kind of get out of your rut. Check out my Macy's wish list. I have all the things that I love and that I'm using across all departments, houseware, homeware, clothing, kids, etc. And you can check that out inside the description of this podcast. You'll see my Macy's wish list. You can use that. And then wonderful pistachios we're big fans of here. Not only are they a delicious snack, they are really yummy. And they have different flavors like sweet chili, salt and vinegar that we're big fans of. We add them into our meals for extra protein because each one ounce serving has six grams of protein adds up to a little over 10% of your daily value. Um, so guys, if you're looking for a new way to snack, make sure you visit wonderfulpistachios.com. All right. Again, I just wanted to ask about like what you can do to, if you're having to do all of these scans, what can you do mm -hmm. to keep yourself healthy mm -hmm. and to help get it out of your body? Mm -hmm. So um, a resource that I used when uh, I interviewed her on my podcast, she'd probably be a good guest for you too, is Dr. Jen Simmons. She's a... Uh, former breast surgeon who has turned functional medicine doctor. 
And um, she has in, she, I've forgotten the name of her book, but she has in her book a protocol when you're going with, if you have to have radiation. And it involves, I believe, um, well, it's definitely high dose melatonin. So melatonin at low dosages puts us to sleep at very high dosages, such as 180 milligrams. There's a lot of research out there about it preventing metastasis, but it acts as an anti-inflammatory. So you can take melatonin, vitamin C, curcumin. She has a whole regimen of what to take if you need to have radiation. On my journey, I was, um, I can find the researcher who did the researcher on 180 milligrams of melatonin preventing metastasis. Because if you think about it, we can pretty much live with cancer. It's when it metastasizes that it kills us. Mm -hmm. So I now take 180 milligrams every night. Uh, it does not make you sleepy. And so that's one way that you can prevent in terms of radiation. I feel like I've heard recently that melatonin wasn't good for you for some reason. I, I, I'm sure for you know, people with cancer, it's, it's probably helpful, but there was something, I have to look it up. Well, there is some, um, what do I wanna say, word out on the street that if you take melatonin that it will suppress your body's own ability to make melatonin, that's... but I think they've pretty much debunked that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then if you're doing something like with a heavy metal, um, you know, this might, I would definitely do saunas, you know, chelating agents, if you could, like chlorella, uh, glutathione, and then make sure you're always taking a binder with that, something like coconut charcoal or clays or something. So that's a heavy metal to help bind. And then if you are seeing some sort of practitioner that does actual chelation, uh, that should also help. But you obviously want to be under the advisement of a doctor if you're going through actual chelation. This is to like detox off the gadolinium. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like, Natasha, I think also you're probably wondering like, there's so much actually out on TikTok and stuff about anti-mammogram. What do people, and we, we talked about the things that you could do instead of the mammogram, but if you've just had cancer and you're like, yeah, I don't want to risk doing another MRI with gadolinium, what else could we offer that person again this is something that i'm learning about so i don't want to you know report that i'm an expert here but what i plan to do going forward without doing mammograms i'll do a thermogram i will continue to do t qt scans and i'll probably do some sort of blood test to check for circulating tumor cells now this can all i mean the first two that i mentioned at least are pay out of pocket right yeah. so i mean thermograms generally a breast thermogram is not that expensive yeah it's like a couple hundred dollars I think, yeah right? right um i think the qt scan uh was about six hundred dollars and then i had to travel somewhere so you know this is not going to be um, necessarily available to everybody. Yet. But my mission now, besides autoimmunity, is to really help get the word out so yeah. that there will become more people, right? I mean, I think probably Pronovo offered you a free scan. They offered me a free scan, uh, which I greatly appreciate. And thank you so much. You know, some people don't have $2,000 to go get a scan. And so, but maybe there'll be competition or maybe there'll be more Pronovos, right? I mean, as we begin to talk about these things and as people demand them, mm -hmm. as people say, I'm not going to do that, I don't want this, there needs to be a better option, then there will be more competition yeah. and these costs will come down. Well, look and, at what Tesla did. Right. Look at how many EV yeah. cars have come out since. That, and that's always been my mission. I mean, ever since I started my practice was a grassroots movement. I really feel that that is what is going to change medicine is people demanding different options. It's yeah. not going to come from within because cancer is a trillion dollar industry. Yeah. I mean. So why don't we leave this right here? We'll come back tomorrow and I'm gonna share what I wasn't able to share before this, but now I feel like I can safely share today. Well tomorrow. <laughs> In the meantime, friends, be nice people, make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment.
Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.